and uh, I think it will get further delayed, due to which I find for one or two months there will be big demand of uh, lentils and people will buy, the, the millers will be, there will be actual buying by the millers from the importers. So you're saying uh, it could be five, six hundred thousand tonne crop max? Max. Okay. Max will be. Harsha, can I ask you, what are your thoughts in terms of the, uh, the crop prospects? Uh, this year, I think the, cro the production for red lentils should not be uh, much bigger than last year. And if you talk about the carryover from last year, we don't see much of the carryover left here uh, for our own desi lentils here. Uh, production should be a little higher in Madhya Pradesh. But again, we had some uh, rain issues a uh, few days back. But that's not a big issue as such right now. Uh, if you talk about the uh, other growing area in India, that is uh, UP, Uttar Pradesh, uh, we had uh, uh, less seeding this year in that uh, part of the India. And we had some uh, major weather issues over there, for sure, for Lanchil's uh, areas. I would say that. Sunil, you want to make a, a stab at the, the crop? What are, you, what are you feeling in terms of the, uh, the crop outlook? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to speak in Hindi, and Nirav will be translated. Uh, actually, numbers ki baat kare to government ke or industry ke numbers mein kafi fark hai. Lekin main aapko thoda sa pehle le jana chaunga. Uh, 2005 mein jab uh, uh, export jab ban hua tha, government ne jab India government ne export ban kiya tha, us samay uh, the production of red lentils was greater than its consumption. Production of red lentil was around 12 to 13 lakh uh, ton, whereas domestic consumption was 9 to 11 lakh ton. The surplus production was hence export. So, and uh, another, दूसरा जो कारण रहा है production घटने का, वो सबसे बड़ा कारण रहा है कि plant जो है वो काफी sensitive होता है lentils का और उसका huge impact पड़ता है weather का. तो weather के huge impact के कारण जल्दी खराब हो जाता है और farmers को काफी इसका देखभाल करनी पड़ती है इसलिए फार्मर्स जो है दूसरी क्रॉप की तरफ मूव हो गया दूसरी क्रॉप करने लग गया और इसका एक्सपोर्ट बैन होने के चलते यहां पे प्राइसेस भी लेंटिल्स की काफी नीचे आने लग गई और दूसरी जो क्रॉप्स में काफी पैसे मिलने लग गए इसके चलते जो है इंडिया का प्रोडक्शन धीरे-धीरे कम होने लग गया लास्ट ईयर जैसे नंबर्स की बात करें तो जैसा नीरज ने बोला कि ये 5 से 6 लाख टन हुआ है और इस साल भी शायद ये इसी के आसपास होएगा हालांकि राजस्थान में कुछ एरिया में क्रॉप अच्छा होने की उम्मीद है लेकिन एमपी और यूपी में रेन के चलते और प्रिडिक्शन ये है कि अगले दो तीन दिन में और रेन होएगी तो अगले पंद्रह दिन भी काफी क्रूशियल है इस क्रॉप के लिए तो उसमें काफी फर्क रहेगा यदि वेदर यदि फेवरेबल नहीं होता तो Thank you, Sunil. Uh, I guess the, the, big, uh, the big game in town is Canada, and uh, Gerald, you've been uh, around for a long time. Let's, uh, I, I, I want to sort of try and keep this big picture in terms of what's happening on farms, because clearly Canadian farmers love growing lentils. Yeah, they've, you know, the Pulse Crop Board in Saskatchewan has done a great job funding our research. We've got new varieties. Uh, the agronomics are improving all the time for Canadian farmers. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good fit for the rotation. They've, uh, they, they've done a good job growing lentils. It's, they've mastered the skill. How much is, is genetics, uh, or is it uh, the farmer's practices? Because uh, I, I contrast with what's happening in India, where the Indian farmer is clearly saying, I'm not making enough money out of lentils. So, how much is genetics and how much is husbandry uh, in terms of the, the Canadian farmer's success? I think they're both equally important. Uh, we, we've had uh, a lot of work done on, on disease resistance. There's a comfort level being as with the growers now in the agronomics in terms of planting, harvesting techniques. So I think both have worked hand in hand over the last 20 years to get to where we're at today. Wonderful. Rob, you want to make some comments uh, about uh, and how you're seeing the, the, I guess the global S and D, but particularly North America, and um, in the context of what's also happening in India. 
As far as the global uh, lentil SND goes, I think it's pretty balanced uh, with uh, little uh, short supply. If you look at Tur the situations in Turkey and India, uh, Canada had a decent crop last year, so that helped the global SND. And because of that, we are not seeing the prices we saw last year. Uh, going forward, we see um, that India is not going to have more than uh, half a million to 600,000 tons, which creates a demand for another year of, as uh, Sunil said, for close to half a million tons of imports. So um, out of which I think India has uh, pretty much covered 50 to 60 percent of what they need uh, in forward contracts up to October, November. Uh, if you look at the world market, uh, the only game in town till November is Canada, as you all know. And uh, uh, till uh, November, there is no other country which can uh, help the world to import red lentils. And Canada is also uh, pretty much sold out for the current crop year till September because uh, we don't have stocks more than 150 to 200,000 tons left, which are not spoken for. There must be, there must, there could be a bigger number lying on the farm but uh, most of it has already been spoken for that means they already sold for april may june july deliveries uh, turkey will uh, have an impact on the market they are already very aggressive uh, so is dubai uh, and because of australian farmers not selling we are seeing a decent amount of demand from sri lanka and pakistan for canadian reds uh, said that till new crop i think the market is going to be pretty balanced uh, we got to see what's going to happen in uh, the logistics sides of Canada, if things don't improve, then you might see uh, a local spike in the prices because of shortages on arrivals in the Indian subcontinent. Let's, let's talk a little bit about those arrivals. One of the major things that has been a feature of this conference for the last uh, couple of days has in fact been logistics and Canadian logistics. So maybe a 10 second tour of how we got to where we are in terms of uh, Canadian logistics, uh, you know, and what really does fundamentally need to change in the future. I mean, we are where we are today, but what does the industry in Canada need to do to get more rolling stock to be able to satisfy the market when it needs to be satisfied, which has always been a, an issue out of Canada? Gerald? I, I'm not going to defend the railroads, and clearly uh, they're an easy target. There are only two of them. Um, their, their point would be that we grew almost two crops last year, and for us to expect them to move two crops in one year is, is unreasonable. Fair enough. Um, you know, Canada is a producer of lots of things other than lentils, believe it or not, and so we have a lot of oil moving, a lot of potash, a lot of lumber. We've also come through probably the most severe winter in the last 50 or 75 years, and that has a significant impact on the operational uh, challenges that the railroad faces. Uh, there, there's a myriad of problems that sort of conspired simultaneously um, I think we can do better in the future, and part of that is going to be producing a more normal crop this coming year. I don't think we're going to have the stocks that we had this past year. That was a, a once-in-a-lifetime uh, scenario. Uh, investment in railroads, we love to see that in terms of more rolling stock. Uh, the railroads are trying hard to avoid uh, congestion and, uh, and challenges like that in Vancouver. It wasn't that long ago that Vancouver was plugged a few years ago. We kind of overwhelmed the port with uh, grain cars. So the railroads are trying to help us to manage uh, the product flow as well. We'd love to see more cars. We'd love to see them uh, shipping less oil, more, more lentils. Uh, I think we'll sort this thing out. Will we have a repeat of what we had this past year? I, I think we'll, we're going to learn from this, and there's incremental steps we'll be taking to avoid what we're going through right now. What, what about regulation? And I guess we are dwelling a bit on logistics because it is just so important. Uh, Jeff, uh, in his uh, talk yesterday, uh, mentioned that he's at least got the option to pay over tariff to secure rolling stock. That's not really available in Canada, is it? For the bulk grain movements, there are statutory rates that are in place and there's rail caps. It's a very convoluted historical discussion, but uh, the railroads are, are kind of boxed in uh, with, with regulated rates. So even if we were to offer the railroads more money to get in front of the lineup to get more cars, that, that, that scenario doesn't exist. Nor can I buy rail cars and ask them to use our rail cars and run them back and forth to the port. It's, it's, a, it's a common fleet that we all share. Um, 
so then the next step is what, how else can we ship the grain? That involves getting inland containers and, and working in that direction, pay more freight. But again, those containers have to be stopped and placed inland for us to use. And, and the volume that wants to move overwhelms the availability of the containers inland. Understood. Staying, I guess, a little bit on regulation, but let's talk about the Indian regulations, particularly the export ban, the licensing for you know, importing product and then exporting it uh, in a value-added format. You know, how important is it to the industry to have that sort of flexibility? I'll ask Harsha and then maybe Rav can comment as well. Uh, well, it's, uh, this kind of regulation uh, is pretty interesting at this point of time, wherein you're allowed to import uh, and being a processor, uh, you're allowed to export as well. But the, the important question is, uh, is there any parity at the moment? The other thing is, uh, do we have that kind of arrivals right now in India wherein we can apply for that license at right time and then we can uh, decide upon our re-export prices? Uh, because uh, whatever India has traded right now coming from Canada, I think because of the logistical issues, there are a lot of problems and uh, it is not uh, very effective for an exporter to decide on price and shipments at the moment. So this is a pretty good uh, regulation uh, wherein if we could see a lot of exports happening from India if there is parity uh, in the market, I would say. But if you're the Prime Minister of India, would you get rid of the, uh, the export ban? Oh, it, it could happen. Harsha could be Prime Minister. I, I would think she'd make a very good Prime Minister. But would you uh, get rid of the export ban? Uh, I'm watching this from so many years, but uh, I don't see a solution to this uh, problem because uh, uh, it is very important to have that kind of pro production in India. If you talk particularly about lentils right now, if you're talking about exports, if you go to the central part of India, that is Madhya Pradesh, our farmers are now uh, getting more into oil seeds uh, rather than going into lentils or you know uh, pulses. Because uh, if you notice from last uh, few years, we are seeing great change in weather all over the world. So weather is a ma major concern for our farmers as well. If you take oil seeds, even if there is a damage, they still have the price for their product, unlike uh, the pulses. So it's most important that you have that kind of production number here, and then uh, I think the government or uh, the, the right authorities can think on uh, the opening the export of uh, the pulses. Right now, we are not able to see that exactly. I personally think that uh, Indian government is already working on uh, uh, export uh, on versus import. So whatever you import, they can uh, export against that. Uh, they want to protect the farmers as, and, as, as, and they want to keep the inflation to realistic levels. So there is a very thin line they are walking. It's not an easy decision for government of India to balance uh, inflation and protect the farmers. But said that if they uh, allow exports against imports, it helps the employment. Um, there is a new game in town suddenly on the split market, uh, which is going to make uh, life uh, more competitive for other splitters around the world. Plus, um, Indian market would be a better placed where there will be less speculation because they will also have an additional exit point. So it will become more of a supply chain than just speculation because they will have an avenue if the local market does not better, they can at least export and get some of their uh, returns back. Uh, on the other hand, it's going to help the forex for uh, India. Their currency is going to be better because they will have more revenues in US dollars, which is again going to help uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the discussion that uh, they want to ban import of pulses because of a lot of other reasons, because the food bill is very high and the dollar is suffering, and the rupee is suffering against the dollar because of that reason. Wonderful. Staying a little bit with that theme, and, and Harsh has brought weather into it, and it just appears to me that uh, there's a couple of things that are, are really important, that we do need to have, I think, less regulation, or governments need to, uh, when they intervene in markets, they need to have a very, very soft hand. but. We'll talk about some of the bigger picture stuff in terms of, of weather and climate uh, and what's actually happening because Gerald made a comment last night that we're actually moving the, the lentil area 50 kilometres uh, west each year. So I, I don't know how many years before that's in Vancouver, Gerald, but uh, you want to make some comments on that and what we're seeing in terms of weather? 
Well, 30 years ago, we grew lentils in Manitoba, which is the eastern prairie province, and that has stopped. And that line of lentil production is, is shifting um, to the west, I would say 50 to 100 kilometers a year. And this last four or five years, we've kind of lost southeastern Saskatchewan uh, too wet. And so that whole production region is shifting into a drier part of the prairies. What's backfilling behind that is, uh, is corn, uh, soybeans, uh, the agronomics, and the plant breeding are, are allowing uh, crops to be grown in, in the prairies that couldn't be thought of 10, 15 years ago. Um, the, the whole plant breeding program that's in place now is, 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 is pretty phenomenal what's happening globally. Um, so there are other crops, there are other alternatives, and lentils fit in well, but we're, we're losing some of the production base to these new crops. I think that's a very good point, and we had the very good presentation this morning from the uh, from NCDX and uh, talking about the uh, the Chana futures. And I guess I'm firmly convinced that if we if we can have more transparency and more rigor and stability in the market, then but you know farmers and traders will participate in it. And we're definitely seeing in in Canada, I think Australia, a move towards those crops that are deemed more readily hedgeable uh, than say crops that aren't. So maybe just a very quick comments from every panel member. I mean, lentil uh, futures, is, is, there a, is there a future in lentil futures? Starting with you, Roma. There could be a lentil future contract, but I don't see that happening for another five, six years, purely because uh, there's not enough uh, volume. Um, it's, it's a trade which is not happening on an everyday basis. So when you're hedging a commodity, whoever is underwriting a contract uh, needs to have an exit and an entry point. So sometimes this market becomes 